My name is Brian Edwards. I'm the Dean of the School of Liberal Arts here at Tulane. Our special guest is already teasing me and he asked me who was my counterpart in the School of Conservative Arts, but um, <laughs> um, this is not the time for my speech about where the word liberal comes from in liberal arts. Um, but it is really an honor for me and all of my colleagues here at Tulane University to welcome you uh, back to this session and to be a part of the New Orleans Book Festival 2023 edition. Uh, and it's my special pride and pleasure to get the opportunity to open up this uh, fabulous panel uh, t uh, this afternoon uh, and to celebrate the Edgar Award winning author Walter Mosley. Uh, who is truly one of the most versatile and admired writers in America, um, and who has written several, several critically acclaimed books, as you know, covering a wide range of ideas, genres, and forms. Um, we like to say here, when we are opening panels in, in New Orleans, find the connections uh, to New Orleans and Louisiana, and you may uh, or may not know that his father is originally from New Iberia, Louisiana, so welcome back in some sort of way. <laughs> um, Walter uh, Mosley is here with us today to discuss the power of craft and narrative in crime fiction, focusing on his two novels that feature protagonists Joe King Oliver, Down the River and Unto the Sea, and Every Man a King, as well as his most recent novel featuring the beloved, uh, a character that's so beloved that it's a part of American, is a real person in American history now, I think, E.Z. Rollins, in, entitled Blood Grove. Um, you know him also as the winner of the National Book Foundation Medal for Distinguished Contribution to American Letters, uh, and we're just so thrilled to have him here. We are also thrilled to welcome uh, the moderator and interviewer um, uh, uh, for this discussion, hotelier and philanthropist Michael O. Smith. Michael is the general manager, let's go, applause. Michael Smith is the general manager of Hyatt Regency New Orleans, and uh, which is a generous sponsor of New Orleans Book Festival 2023. And for his commitment to and work on behalf of civic causes, he has been honored with several awards in his career. Most recently, two that I'm going to mention in 2019 uh, with the Times Picayune Loving Cup, uh, which has been awarded since 1901 to individuals who have worked unselfishly for the New Orleans community without expectation of public recognition or material reward. Uh, we publicly recognize you for that award. Uh, and in 2022, he uh, was recognized with the A.I. Botnick Torch of Liberty Award from the Anti-Defamation League South Central Region for his incredible accomplishments and civic engagement with the community of New Orleans. These are not only great tributes to his career, but really shows you something about his great character and contributions to our wonderful city. So without further ado, you're not here for me, Walter Mosley and Michael O. Smith. I'm delighted to welcome you both. Thank you. Devil in a blue dress. Trouble is what I do. Every man a king. From Easy Rollins to Joe King Oliver, Leonard McGill, and of course, Phyllis Jones. Walter Mosley's fertile imagination has created colorful characters with depth and renaissance, beloved by presidents and all of us. Whether you read for escape or for the suspense, every Mosley's story is a gift guaranteed never to disappoint. We are honored to have the highly distinguished, award-winning, and legendary writer with us today. It's my pleasure to introduce you to Walter Mosley. Thank you. <clears throat> Let's get started. Mr. Mosley, for aspiring writers in the audience today, I'd like to start at the very beginning because mm. your initial career was as a computer programmer. So when did you know you wanted to be a writer? Uh, I, was, I was a programmer. I was working for uh, Mobile Oil. I was a, a consultant, so I could work any time I wanted. And I was alone, on, I, think, I think on a Saturday, and I wrote, and, and I was typing in code, and I, I got tired of doing that, so I wrote a sentence. And, and the sentence was, on, on hot, sticky days in southern Louisiana, the fire ants swarmed. And I, and I looked at that, and I said, that sounds like it could be a book. It's like, I've read books before, and they, they start like that, you know, kind of a little, a little pedestrian, but also, you know. And, and, it, and I knew it had to be fiction, because at that time, I had never been to Louisiana, and I'd never seen a fire ant, so I was making it up, and, um, and I, hoping I was right. And so, and I was, I think I was maybe 34, 35, 
uh, uh, working there at Mobile Oil on 42nd Street in Manhattan. And I, I said, well, I'm going to let's see if I, can, if I can write. I didn't say I'm going to be a writer. I said, let me see if I can write, you know. So tell us about the first story you ever wrote and how it was received. And just for the audience, the first story he wrote wasn't Devil in the Blue Dress. It was a book called Gone Fishing. Hmm. And then Gone Fishing was the sixth installment of the Easy Rollins mystery. Can you speak to, to that evolution and how it evolved? Well, you know, I was, I was studying uh, writing at, um, in a graduate program at City College in New York, you know, up in Harlem. And uh, one of the teachers there was, I think still, the greatest living writer in the English language, Edna O'Brien. And she, you know, I was I, I wrote a, you know some story, some things. I put them together, and I and I turned it into into the room, and 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 she, you know, she with her beautiful Irish brogue went, I can't do it, but she goes, Walter, writes a novel, you know, and I went, okay, you know, and I went and I wrote a novel. <laughs> it was like I took that stuff and I made it into a novel. It took about six weeks, and and you know, it's a good book. I mean, I think it's you know, coming of age novel of 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 two major black characters, Easy and Mouse. Uh, when they're you know, 18, 19, uh, in, 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 uh, you know, in, in, in uh, Fifth Ward, Houston, and also in, a, in the mythical uh, you know, bayou town of Pariah. And, and I, I wrote it, and I sent it out, and I sent it to a lot of people, and, and, they, and they all wrote back the same thing. They said, well, it's, the writing is really good, but it's not commercial, so we can't publish it. And, and, I, and I thought about that, you know, for a while, and I talked to people about it, and finally it came out that, that publishers in New York thought this, that white people don't read about black people, black women don't like black men, and black men don't read. And so, who's gonna read your book? Because it's about two black men, you know? Um, now, they were wrong in one way, but they were right in another way, because if they believed it and they enforced it, then it was true, you know? Um, but um, yeah, and then I, so I, I wrote it, and, and nobody would publish it. So you know, I, I wasn't expecting to get published anyway. So I put it aside, and uh, and then later on, I wrote Devil in a Blue Dress using the same two characters, mm -hmm. but there was some white people in it, and 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 it was a mystery. And so they published it. You know, it was like you know, because you know, Gone Fishing wasn't a mystery. It was yeah. just a book. Well, you spoke to uh, Edna O'Brien, and uh, I read that she actually mentioned you in her memoirs. She what did. What did she say? Well, what she said in her memoir is that, you know, is something she said to me. She said, you know, Walter, you're black and you're Jewish. Uh, you have this incredible wealth. You know, you need to get into it and write about it. The thing is, is I already knew that I was black and Jewish, and I was <laughs> always already using it. And so, but, but the thing, but the thing that, was most important that she ever said to me was write a novel. Like, you know, to have somebody you think is the greatest writer in the, in the English language alive tell you you should write a novel, well, that, was, that really was the extraordinary thing for me. And, uh, you know, but I love Edna, you know, and, you know, she wrote it and I was in her memoir and I think, God, I was in her memoir. You know, yeah. you know Edna O'Brien, you know, she was a good friend of, 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 of Jackie Kennedy, Jackie O. And, I mean, when you look, if you, when you saw them together, if, if you just saw them on the street and you didn't know who they were, you would definitely start talking to Edna, you know, because she's so, like, beautiful and, like, you know, extraordinary. And she knew every major actor in Hollywood, you know. Mm -hmm. She once left, and, and she was being interviewed for the New York Times. They're doing a big, you know, uh, thing on her. And, and uh, Sean Connery and Anthony Quinn walked in, and she walked out on the interviewer. She said, I don't care about you. Look at those actors over there. I'm going to be with them. You know, it was a bad, uh, they gave her a bad, uh, 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 you know, profile. But, but she didn't care. She said, no, Brian, who cares? You know? So, Walter, how did growing up in Los Angeles uh, impact your storytelling and the nuance of Devil in a Blue Dress and, and characters like uh, Easy Rollins and, and Jackson Blue? and my all-time favorite, Raymond Mouse Alexander. Why would you like him? I mean, oh, You really I'm, want to know? You really want to know? Yeah. I like him because you described him in, the, in that narrative when he came out of the Fifth Ward in Houston every time Easy got into trouble, and all he ever wanted to do 
was shoot a motherfucker. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> that was that great thing when Easy was sad and he said, um, uh, what you said about it? I said, well, you know, the tax man, the, the, you know, the uh, IRS man, he's after me. He said, well, I'll just shoot him. <laughs> and he said, I, and Easy said, well, but they're just going to bring another one. He said, I killed that motherfucker too. And then I burned down the whole, you know, the government building. And, you know, it's like, it's so wonderful. Everybody loves that. You know, it, it, it's, it, it uh, transcends race, which is something I never try to do. But uh, it, it happens every once in a while. Mouse is like, everybody loves him. I always go to these readings, you know, and these little white ladies, you know, come up. I love that mouse. <laughs> and you just one, you know, what's going on in that mind and that life, you know, it's so great. Uh, growing up in Los Angeles, you know, wherever you grow up, wherever you spend your time, that's going to have a, a big unconscious effect on you. The, you know, the weather, the, 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 the light, the dark, the, the, the politics, the police, all this other stuff. But, you know, my father... My father was a great storyteller. He really was. He was a great storyteller. And, 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 you know, he came from poor black stock, you know, from Texas and Louisiana, who, you know, I mean, the only thing you could do is, you know, drink and eat and tell stories. And, and my mother's people were all poor Jews from Eastern Europe. And they were the same thing, you know, you drink and eat and tell stories. And the stories were very, very similar. Now, that was the thing that really got to me, you know, uh, the, you know, there was all of the, tr both people treated as a, a race that wasn't human. Uh, both people kept in uh, ghettos and shtetls and uh, hung and burned and, 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 and refused their political rights in the, in the country where they lived, you know. And so it was, there was a, there was a theme in my life of, you know, people eating and drinking and telling stories who've, who've had this really horrendous experience, but, but their response is to laugh about it, you know, and, and, and to say, well, you know, man, it ain't that bad, you're still living, you know? Okay. So clearly the African-American and Jewish experiences played a huge part in your storytelling, mm -hmm. as you just mentioned. If you said that the people who write prose don't pay enough attention to language, and your books are filled with fervent narrative, so would you say that ultimately language defines Walter Mosley's style? Well, you know, I, I'm so, uh, I, I, I so much love to, you know, I, you know, you love those books that you pick it up and you can't stop reading them. Because, you know, I don't really like reading for reading's sake. I read because, you know, it, it, it pulls me in, it tells me something, it makes me enjoy it. People say, like, things in a certain twist, and I just, you know, I just laugh. I think, wow, that, that, was, that was good. That was good. I wish I said that. You know, <laughs> I mean, that, that's, that, I love it. And so, um, and, you know, and, you know, I, there are a lot of people. America's a very scientific place, you know. We all... We all talk like we know what science is. Most of us don't. It's not a bad thing. We just don't, mm -hmm. you know. But but we think that you know. But but if the thing is, is people believe they have to be completely conscious in order to create something. Yeah, I have to know what the beginning is. I have to know what the end is. Before I start, I have to know not only who the character is, but who his mother was and his first dog and and you know and. Uh, the first time he felt pain, you know, you're going, my God, I just write about the characters. They tell me what, you know, what, what happened by, by living their lives. And, you know, and so a lot of my writing, I, 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 I know, comes from an unconscious space. Mm -hmm. and, 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 that, and, I, and I love that. But because of that, it's hard to say, you know, yes, language is very important to me. Um, but... I, I leave it to somebody else to say what my books are actually about and where they come from. Well, you can leave it up to me to tell you what it's about. Okay, that's saying. fine. That's good. Uh, and listen to these names. Agatha Christie, Raymond Chandler, Mickey Spillane, Dashiell Hammett, all have found generational acclaim through their characters and through media. Where do you see Easy Rollins and Mysteries in current time and space in, 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 in a comparable? Well, you know, I think the, the, the mystery world, one of the great things about the mystery world is the writers are not stuck up. This is really true. But, you know, all, I mean, Chandler was a little stuck up, but, 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 he, but still, it's because he was English. But, but the thing is that, <laughs> that, that most mystery writers, we, we're just having a good time. And, and, and it, it's like every, it's like 
the English language. You know, where did it come from? It came from like a billion people over thousands of years, you know, uh, talking, in making, creating, you know, uh, images, quotes, ideas. Uh, so I, you know, I, I, I feel in that way, I'm just a part you know, of, of a wave of mystery writers who are creating a genre. Now, of course, the, the people you're talking about, you know, uh, you know, Christy, she, you know, very much about plot and very good at it, mm -hmm. you know, uh, and, and she's kind of funny. Uh, uh, Chandler and Ham Hammett are both very hard boiled and uh, they're, and they're, and, and, and they, and they began that existentialism in, 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 in the noir genre. Uh, and it was an interesting uh, existentialism. It was a, a man who, he, he, he doesn't, he lives in an apartment. It's never the same apartment. He has a car. It's always broken down. He doesn't have a dog, a mother, a girlfriend, a child. He has nothing. And so if he gets in trouble, he just says, hey, all right, you want to arrest me? You want to throw me in jail? I don't care, you know? Um, and and, and, and I, you love that that kind of perfect existentialist stance. But, you know, as, as, as we've, you know, come further, I, I know a lot I, I did with Easy Rollins. Well, Easy Rollins, you know, he, he, do, he doesn't have, he has a child, but the wife left him with the child. Mm -hmm. uh, he, he adopted uh, two kids. Uh, he bought a house that he loves. He, and he, then he started getting, an, and, you know, he has really good friends, and when they come to him, he feels very committed to black people, period. If he sees a black person on the street, they seem to be worried. He will stop and ask them what's going on and, and try to help if he can, you know? And, and that, that makes it much harder because, you know, he, you can't throw him in jail if he has like a four-year-old daughter at home, yep. right? He had to go home and take care of that daughter. And so he has to figure out how to get out without breaking, you know, his code of what's right, mm -hmm. you know? And, that, and that's really fun. Well, he helped white people, uh, it, what I found interesting about Easy, you take him from 1948 to 1968, and when I look at the evolution of that character, uh, at one point he was doing the McCarthy era, uh, another time he was working for the FBI, you know, he's working with policemen, he was in the white neighborhoods, he was in the black neighborhoods, he was in the Jewish neighborhoods. I mean, you took his character and you evolved him over uh, the period of three decades, uh, 20 years, but two decades. Can you talk about the evolution of that character? We know with, the... With, 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 with the, the, the social consciousness or the, the time and place and the period that you wrote, wrote in. Well, you know, another thing about the, the earlier mystery writers, you know, yours is just like the, the tip of the iceberg, but, you know, there's hundreds of them, thousands. And they, uh, when they would do, um, when they would, would, would do series, you know, like one of the greats, uh, Rex Stout, you know, with his Nero Wolf uh, uh, series. The time didn't pass by. Time was passing by mm -hmm. for the readers, but for, for them, it was pretty much, they were the same people in the same place. They, 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 they're 25, 30 years older, but they're still doing the same things. Archie's still going out with all those women, and, you know, <laughs> and, and Nero Wolf, he could eat and eat and eat and eat, and nothing ever happens to him, you know? Um, <laughs> And it's fun, especially because, you know, the, 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 the Nero Wolf were kind of comical. And when you're comical, you can get away with that. But one of the things that I, I, I made a commitment to very early is that time was going to pass. Because I wanted to, to talk about um, black people in Los Angeles. I, want, I wanted to see them when, you know, when they were first there, when they were there for five years, when they were there for seven years. I wanted to see them with the hippies. I wanted to see them, you know, uh, you know with, with the Red Scare. Um, and it's, it was very important to me because one thing I know is like people write books of history, but most people don't read those books. You know, those, those are things you do at universities. Those are things that only certain people do. But if you're not in the fiction, then you're not in history. If, if people don't talk about you if, you, if you don't, if you don't see it, you know, and also it's true about movies and music and all that other stuff, but uh, you know, I write novels. And so like, if, if you don't put black people in novels, they really don't exist as far as the culture is concerned. Mm -hmm. You know, and I really wanted to be able to talk about people in a way, you know, because those people were right about black, black men not liking to read fiction that misrepresented who they were. Mm -hmm. And so, I don't recognize that man. I wouldn't be like that. Even if I was a pimp, I wouldn't do that, you know, you know, and I'm not a pimp, 
<laughs> you know, and so, but like, like the, um, so, I mean, so, so that's, I mean, that's an answer, kind of broad, but <laughs> still an answer. So, uh, you've had several movies made, but I want to give you this lineup because I think it's pretty interesting. Denzel Washington played Devil in a Blue Dress, Easy Rollins. Don Cheadle was my man, Miles Alexander. Lawrence Fishburne, always outnumbered, always that gun. And now, uh, last year with Samuel L. Jackson, yeah. uh, have acted in, as characters. How do you feel about those selections? And did you select them for those roles? And if so, why? Well, sometimes I selected them. I wanted uh, uh, Danny Glover to play Easy Rollins, but they wouldn't do it. So, you know, we took Denzel. I know it sounds funny for me to say that, but it's true. <laughs> um, uh, Lawrence, I ran into in New Orleans. And I said, Lawrence, I got this book, you know? It's called Always Had a Number. I think you'd be great to star in it. And he, he's so funny, he went, okay. You know, and I went, wow, that was easy, you know? Samuel Jackson called me 10 years ago and said, I want to do The Last Days of Ptolemy Gray. I read that book, a lot of people in my family got dementia, I want to do it. And he, and he stuck with me the whole 10 years in, in order to make it. He, he was a producer, he was, you know, very connected. You know, I mean, there, one of the things about um, uh, representing uh, uh, black men and women uh, in, in a way that uh, the reader feels there's a lot of reality to that is that the actors say, hey, I would like to do something with a lot of reality. I don't want like, you know, because, you know, listen, um, you know, Beverly Hills Cop is really a fun movie. Let's, let's, let's be, be honest. But that was written for Sylvester Stallone. <laughs> and, you know, and, you know, Sylvester asked for too much and, and, and Eddie Murphy got it. But, you know, you, to play those characters, there's, you, there's, no, there's no cultural depth to it. There's no historical depth. And, um, and you know, in most of my books there is. And so, you know, I, I've, I've, I've been lucky enough to get really uh, good uh, actors and actresses who, you know, want to be in it. Segway, you are currently writing for the acclaimed series Snowfall. Yes. And you have excelled in other genres with over 50 books, and we'll get to that a little bit later, uh, in publications. How would that uh, impact where you take Easy Rollins as a series for small or large screen? Now, how, how would impact it? Uh, how would that impact those books and writing for Snowfall impact how you t where you take Easy Rollins for the small or large screen? Well, you know, I mean, listen, I mean, doing Easy Rollins is so hard because, you know, I, I, I just, a, 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 a company just turned it down. They actually paid me to write a, a pilot, and they kept saying, but can't you make him like other detectives? Can't, you know? And I went, no, he's not another detective. He's Easy Rollins. I mean, I can't, I can't do it, you know? And uh, so there's a, there's a, there are a lot of problems there. Who, who knows if I'm ever going to do it? I have a wonderful script for it, but I don't know. I don't know who, if, if we'll ever you know, uh, get it made. Uh, uh, Snowfall is interesting. Snowfall, um, seven years ago, uh, John uh, Singleton called me, and he said, Walter, uh, I'm doing a, a series about our, our uh, community. You, you're a little older, but our community through the crack uh, epidemic. And uh, I, I, I want you to be in the room. And I said, well, John, I don't know how to write television shows. I mean, it's not going to work. He said, I don't care, man. Just come in there and back me up, <laughs> you know, which sounded very much like, you know, the show. And so I went, all right, I'll do that. And, you know, and for a couple of years, that's all I did. You know, I, I just, you know, I, I, people say, well, we can't do that. And I say, yes, but we should try. You know, and then that was it, you know. And then finally I started writing. I, now, I mean, the show's over now, but, but I, 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 the last two years I've been an executive producer, which is great, mm -hmm. you know. It's great for your income, you know. I mean, <laughs> when I say great, that's what I mean. Because <laughs> what's really great is writing novels. But, but you know, if you, if you have to make money every once in a while, it's good to, you know. Well, your, your, your character Evolution of Easy, uh, uh, the genesis of those stories started 30 years ago. Mm -hmm. uh, how would you, if, say, from 92 to now, and then in the previous 30 years it was, it was something different, but how would you uh, uh, characterize your content currently uh, uh, as it, it relates to racial inequality, social justice, as well as politics? Well, I think if you, if you write about people as people, no matter who you're writing about, they might have a, you know, different backgrounds, different experiences, and because of, the, of those things, they, they, they deal with each other differently. Or I, I think that that 
is enough. I, I, you know, it, it's, I don't need to explain to people you know, how you know, everybody in America is racist. I, I don't. I mean, either you know it or you don't. Mm -hmm. But you know, what I need to do is talk about uh, put those people in, in positions and situations that they have n they've never seen before. Like I have this book um, of short stories, The Awkward Black Man. They're, these are black men doing things. One's worried about his weight. One has a broken heart, and and it stays with him for thirty years. You know, uh, you know, another is sick. Another, uh, you know, people say, "I'm gonna hire you for this job," you know, uh, because you're an African American. He said, "Hold up, I am not African American. Mm -hmm. I, I, you know, I don't know where I'm from, but if I'm, I, but I'm from somewhere. So I might be an Ethiopian American, a Watusi American, but I ain't no." African American, and you say, "Man, shut up! You, this man won't give you a job. Just shut up! Don't don't say anything." You know, but he can't. But you know that guy who's always stepping on his own toes. I, you just love him, and you know him, and you are him often. You know, you say, "No, I can't accept this," and they say, "Well, you see that? That's why these people are stupid. They don't know how to, you know." But no, yeah. it, it's like the. And, but everybody has that kind of identity. Yeah. And if you can make everybody understand it, then you have done something. Well, you depicted black men as heroes and anti-heroes over the last 30 years. Yes. Uh, and, and, and we're in the same bucket as far as uh, age is concerned. Uh, but this is in front of the previous 30 years when we were dealing with uh, black exploitation and Shaft and, and Superfly mm -hmm. but for, uh, for our generation. But was this your mission to, uh, to depict black men in, in, in this light? And, and has it been a knowledge in your claim? Well, you know, I, I mean, to answer that, I mean, it's like using a, one of my favorite characters, Jackson Blue. Yep. Jackson Blue, he's not terribly moral. He's a complete coward. <laughs> uh, and he's also a genius. I mean, he understands numbers and, 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 and facts in rows better than anybody. And slowly over time, he's become the number one assistant of the French president of the largest insurance company in the world. Yep. He's one of the most powerful people in that business. And, and he does all this other stuff. At the same time, Mouse has become a professional heist man. He, when, when, when the mob wants to do a heist, they call him out. They say, listen, man, you're pretty good at that because you don't kill all them motherfuckers. And it's, <laughs> that's good because we don't want to kill everybody. And he said, okay, fine, I'll go out. And he's you know, started reading books. Mm -hmm. you know? uh, and, and when Easy looks at them, he says, wow, man, you people have advanced beyond me. Mm -hmm. you know? And I think talking about th things like that is a difference from Shaft and, you know, because there were certain kind of, you know, kind of roles they had to fit in. It was a very important, like Shaft was very important, uh, a very important character uh, concretizing black masculinity. I think that there's no question about that. But, you know, but that's over now. There's other things to do now. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, and, you know, I, you know, I try, a lot of people do. A lot of people are, you know, doing that work and I think it's good. Could you speak to your relationship with Paul Coates and, uh, and the impact Walter Bernstein, the, the filmmaker, uh, has had in your career? Well, those are two big questions. Walt, Walt, you know, Paul Coates. Um, Paul Coates, uh, I, I, I met him once. I, I'd gone to a, 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 a lecture and the guy said, if you're a writer and you're successful, every once in a while, why don't you give a book to a small black publisher? And, I, you know, it was just true. Like, yes, that makes sense. You know, that you have all these small publishers who are struggling to make it, but they're, they're keeping our culture alive in ways that the big publishers never could. And so I, I, I found him and I said, hey, uh, Mr. Coates. And he goes, yeah. He said, I said, well, yeah, I want to give a, a book to a small black publisher, you know, or I might have just said to a, a, an a independent publisher or something, but he didn't think I was talking about him. Mm -hmm. And it was very funny, but he did he ultimately. You know, Paul was the head of the Black Panthers yep. in Baltimore. Yep. He's Ta-Nehisi Coates' father. Mm -hmm. He's, I mean, he's like all this stuff. And, and, but we, we published that book together, you know, uh, you know, it was Gone Fishing. And, and, and 
it was just wonderful. I mean, it was it was so wonderful that you know, and and year a couple of years later we were traveling around the country together doing something else about books, and uh, you'd be in a place you know like Des Moines, and 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 a couple of older black men would walk up to us and say, hey. Uh, you guys published that book together. And we said yes, and we thought we were gonna talk about the book, and they would say, uh, are you still friends? Because, <laughs> you know, it's hard for black men to work together. So everybody think, we, you know, everybody, because, you know, everybody's cheating everybody, you think. It's not true, but you think it. Uh, so that's one thing, that's, that's Paul Coates. I love Paul, he's great, he's wonderful. Um, and then there's Walter Bernstein. Walter Bernstein was a communist, serious communist, and uh, he was also an American, he was also patriotic, he also fought in World War II. He also, uh, one day, in the middle of World War II, went to Yugoslavia, Nazi-occupied Yugoslavia, and walked all the way across and was the first American to interview Tito. He is an extraordinary human being. He died uh, a year ago at the age of 102. And he, I, and he you know, he just kind of, he was my agent's uh, husband, and he just, kind of pulled me along into the film world. He introduced me to all these people. We, we, we told great stories together. Uh, he, was, he was really, he was a, really a wonderful man. He made a movie called The Front. If you haven't seen it, yep. you need to see it. It's the only movie that Woody Allen is really good in, you know? <laughs> and uh, and, uh, and it's, it's a, a strong movie about the blacklist to understand, you know, what it's like to survive in America and its un-American activities, you know. Well, you know, uh, Walter, uh, uh, I consider you uh, uh, a paradigm shifter. Uh, and I listened to you uh, talk today. Uh, but then I look at the, your start as a writer. Uh, and you learn and you taught yourself how to write. And then you took the class on how to write. But then now you teach people how to write a book. But then what really got me, uh, it tells me that you're a man of action, uh, you started this publishing certificate program. Uh, oh, and, yeah. And why do you do all of these things, especially the publishing certificate program, and, and how did that relate in terms of race? Because, you know, you, you, you learn how to write, you did it, but then you, were, you did all these things, all these processes, and you impacted all of those on your own. Well, you know, I mean, no, no human being does anything on their own, but... Yeah. But, I, but I, I was on the board of the National Book Awards. I, most people didn't want me there. Uh, the, this this uh, millionaire wanted to put me on the board, so they did. I think it was just to make fun of them. But I was, I was on the board, and, um, and I was talking one day to another uh, publisher. There was a lot of big publishers there. You know, small writers, big publishers, and you know, the National Book Awards. And so I, the, I, I was talking to a woman about that, that you know, there are very few people hired uh, people of color hired in publishing. And this is because publishing has never gotten money from the government. And the only businesses and things that ever hire people of color are people that, you know, the government tells them they got to do it. You know, uh, government could tell the publishing, they'd say, well, we don't care. We don't get no money from you. Um, and so I, I, I was saying it to this woman, and she said, look, we hire people of color. They don't stay, they leave. And, 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 and I'm going, uh huh, right. Well, and, and she said, well, why do you think they, they leave? I said, they, don't, they leave because you're racist. You know it. Mm -hmm. And as I said it, I went, wow, this is wrong, right? <laughs> this is wrong. I, me, I'm telling this woman she's right. She'd never talk to me again. And I don't blame her, you know, because, you know, I did it wrong. Um, and so then I just decided I'm going to do this on my own. I'm gonna, I, so I went to City College. I said, here's some money, um, and, and, and you're going to start this thing, and you're going to hire people from publishing to teach at City College, you know, most of which is people of color, and teach them how to work in publishing, how to be editors, how to be publicists, how to, how to do all the, you know, things, how to be a publisher, uh, how to design books, all of that stuff. And, um, and, it, and it works. I mean, it, it's still, we still don't have enough people of color in publishing, but it started to work. It was, a one, it was wonderful for me, I just, because I didn't have to do any work. I just had to say, <laughs> do this, you know, and here's, I gave them some money, I gave them $10,000, mm -hmm. you know, which, you know, as you understand, in the university pays for about a day and a half, you know, uh, even if you're not doing anything. So, like, I, I, I just, um, but they, they made this whole thing. It's, it's beautiful, it's still working. It's been, I don't know, 20 years, 22 years, yeah. You know, you crossed over uh, uh, from mystery to short stories, erotica, uh, sci-fi, you know, screenplays. 
How do they compare in process or in or difficulty? Well, I love writing. I mean, I really love writing. When people ask me, they say, what's the best part about being a writer? I always say, well, it's writing. I'm, I'm, I, when I'm writing, that's the best part. This morning I got up, I wrote for two and a half hours, and I said, that's, my day is perfect now, you know? Um, and and I, I mean, I, I think that that's, and so when I'm writing, I, the writing has to fit the, 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 the mode of writing and also maybe the genre of it has to fit what I'm talking about. You know, sometimes uh, I need to write a mystery because it's a mystery. Sometimes it's, it's like spiritual, so it, it becomes like science fiction or some other thing, you know. Um, you know, sometimes it's, it's uh, you know, I like writing about sex, so, you know, sometimes it's about sex. So if it's about sex, I'm not going to call it a mystery, you know. <laughs> I know some people think it is, but it's not. <laughs> and ask a praying mantis, yeah. she knows. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> you know, so, so I mean, the, the, that's, that's the thing. I, I, just, I, I just love going to all these different you know, places in writing. Mm -hmm. I don't really like writing for television because mm -hmm. it's, it's collaborative and I love working on my own. Mm -hmm. But you know, it, you know it, it's okay, you know, especially if you can be, not, you're never in charge, but kind of quasi in charge, it's okay. Mm -hmm. you, know, you seem to uh, have learned to your own beat. You know, you started some schools and you left and, you know, if it didn't mean anything to you and you weren't extracting anything out of it, you did your own thing. But I read where you uh, was reading this Time Life book about Goya. Oh. Uh, could you explain to the audience or maybe discuss with the audience what you extracted from that book? And you say you learned so much from that Time Life book uh, and what it meant to you. Well, I was, I was in a, a doctoral program for political theory at UMass Amherst. And I was studying, you know, all, you know the people. I mean, it was, it's, it's, you know, political theory. It was, it was, it was, a, it was political theory. So, you know, I'm reading Marx and, and 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 Freud and Kant and Hegel and you know, I'm like all these people. I'm reading them, you know, and and I'm going to classes and people are talking and they're very smart, you know, and one day I, I picked up this Time Life book, you know, it's, it's almost like pulp book, and and they talked about. In, in, in Goya's king, uh, there was a lot of thievery, you know, in the capital. And, and he told uh, his head of police, I need you to stop the, the thievery. And the men used to wear these big, bulky pants. And the big, bulky pants, you, you, it's easy to reach into them, and it's easy to hide things. So pickpockets were going crazy. They were stealing stuff everywhere. And that uh, police guy realized it, and he said, okay, no, but no more people can wear these pants, but the men so identified with it that they rebelled. They were fighting. They even attacked the king's guard, which was unthinkable. And so the guy, he, he fired, you know, the police chief and, and people could wear the pants again. And so he brought another guy and he said, listen, you still going to have to stop this crime. He said, no problem, you know, king. And what, what he did was he, he made the uh, executioner, the, the, the clothing of the executioner, those pants. <laughs> Next day, everybody stopped wearing those pants. <laughs> and I learned more about political theory from that than I had in the past two and a half years being in this program. So I dropped out. <laughs> I said, no, uh-uh. This is, because that made sense to me. You know, I mean, all, you know, the, I mean listen, the, there, a lot of these people were really, really, really smart. You know, but they weren't teaching me anything that I could use, you know, in, you know, in, in political theory about, you know, human nature, et cetera, you know. Well, switching gears a bit, okay. um, something I find interesting is that your creative process has at times involved bodies of water. Explain the impact of flowing water in your creative process and inspiring your imagination. I, you know, I, I have no idea. I've lived in many places in my life, and a lot of them have been very beautiful, up in Vermont, uh, out in the desert. Um, but, but recently, I rent an apartment, a, in the last few years, I rent an apartment in Santa Monica that overlooks the Pacific Ocean. And it's the first time ever that every day I look out that window, I stop for a minute and go, oh my God. Because that, that Pacific Ocean, man, it's something. And it's there, and it's talking to you. You know, I mean, and, and it's like, it's wild, and, and so that's why, but I don't know what it means. I, I, I just like, you know, uh, 
you know, I, I once read that, that all mammals that are, you know, more or less hairless, you know, pachyderms, pigs, people, uh, all peas, uh, they were all at some time semi-aquatic. And, 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 and maybe I was once semi, well, but if I was, then we all were, so, you know. <laughs> What was your inspiration? You wrote a, a, a book uh, several years ago, uh, and it was called John Woman. Uh, mm, uh, yeah. alias for Cornelius Jones. Uh, and uh. It, in the initial writing, it had to be 125,000 words, so 100,000 words, was something to that effect. Uh, what was your inspiration for that book specifically? You know, it's such a hard thing to, to say, but uh, John Woman is a novel about a, a sociopath who is also a deconstructionist historian. And I, it's my understanding of history that it's deconstructionist in its nature. You know, I was, I was talking to Walter Isaacson uh, yesterday. He, he was saying, you know, he was nice to me. He said, you know, I really like your work, you know, and he goes, and then, he, you know, maybe a little, with a little false humility saying, well, you know, I'm just a, you know, nonfiction writer. And, but, you know, the truth is, is nonfiction is impossible because nonfiction has to know everything. Fiction doesn't have to know anything, you just make it all up. Mm -hmm. But, but nonfiction, in, in order to tell the truth, it's virtually impossible. And so when anybody is talking history, telling history, it, they're always wrong. And, 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 and it's still something we have to know that we need to work with, but it, we never will have it perfectly right. And, and I wanted to write that story so bad. I just, you know, I mean, I, just, I love, you know, R.G. Collingwood. They're the, these great historian uh, philosophers who, who, know, who knew this, you know. But somehow it's never, you know, historians say, well, listen, we got all the facts and we wrote them down. I said, no, there was 20 million words of facts and you wrote down 40,000 words. You left out millions of words. Something must be wrong, you know. But... You know, and the book is finally done okay. It took me 20 years to write it. Yeah, wow. yeah. So have you written poetry? I've written really bad poetry. <laughs> but I want, you, I want you to know that I think that anybody out, out here who's going to be a fiction writer, uh, the, the greatest way to make your language alive is to understand the uses of poetry. You know, uh, rhyme, uh, rhythm, uh, music itself, uh, repetition, all these things you learn in, in poetry and you learn in writing poetry. And so all that studying of writing poetry, which I did, you know, uh, didn't teach me how to write poetry, but it really helped me write fiction, yeah. Well, I'm at the two minute mark and I'm supposed to leave uh, a couple of minutes for questions. So can we take uh, maybe one question from the audience? There's one right there. There you go. Thank you. My absolute favorite character of yours is Socrates Fortlow, who oh, had yes. such a short run. Can you tell me how you imagined him, how you came up with that character? Uh, well, you know, it's a fun story. I was, uh, when I was in the beginning of my, my career, I think I'd, I'd written uh, Black Betty. I was, I was published by W.W. W. Norton. Uh, they said, Mr. Mosley, we think that, you know, you're, you're black and you're Jewish, kind of like Edna O'Brien, and we're going to send you on a, on a tour of Jewish book fairs in the South. <laughs> and I said, okay, I'll go. And so I'm going to the Jewish book fairs in the South. And, uh, and it's great, Jewish book fairs. Everybody's bought your book and everybody's read it. So like, it's cool, you know? I mean, I'm selling books, that's what you're on tour for. But right over here, there were three ladies, elderly Jewish ladies. Now I'm probably older than they were then, but I, then I thought they were elderly Jewish ladies. And they all said, we see where your father comes from, but we don't understand where, where your mother is. And, and, you know, they didn't really mean that. And, and so, I, you know, I said, well, my mother's smart, and my mother's this, and my mother was a Trotskyite, and she knew this and that and the other. And, and, and they said, yeah, yeah, yeah. But, you know, it's when you had Easy Rollins reading Hadrian, we knew that's the Jewish part. <laughs> and I looked at them, and I said, well, Hadrian is not Jewish? You know, I mean, what? You know, and I wanted to create a Jewish, I mean, a black philosopher that these ladies wouldn't claim. <laughs> and I finally said, well, he's been in prison, he's a murderer, 
<laughs> and, he's, and he knows he did it. He was in prison for 27 years. He's gotten out and he's trying, to, and his mother named him Socrates, you know, because she hoped it would help him. And finally, in this last part, it did. Thank and you. <laughs> thank you. Okay. Okay, well, listen, we thank you very much for your audience. Uh, boy, that 45 minutes went fast. Uh, but I also would like to thank uh, 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 Mr. Walter Mosley. What about a round of applause?